I'm really excited um, to introduce Alexander Vadrusvoitz for today's talk. Um, I think we first met a number of years ago at a conference, and he's really cool um, cheetah cub robot. So it's really exciting to see um, all their great research um, throughout the years and, and um, coming as well. Um, so he researches bio-inspired legged ro uh, locomotion, um, um, observing in cats, spiders, um, birds, and humans. Um, focusing on the biomechanics and neural control of animals and mechanics and control of robots. So a really great blend of um, biology um, and robotics. Um, he received his diploma in mechatronics from Emmenau, uh, Technical University in Germany, um, and PhD um, at EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, um, which mostly is where I did my uh, postdoc as well. So it's nice to see that connection. Um, he's worked in legged robots um, across the world, uh, Switzerland, um, U.S. Oregon State with Jonathan Hurst and um, at uh, MPI in Stuttgart, um, and also uh, with Monica Daly, a biologist um, in, in London, in the U.K. So um, a lot of great inspiration there for really great work. Um, since 2016, um, he leads the research group Dynamic Locomotion at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in uh, Stuttgart, Germany. Um, so today his talk is going to be on an emu-inspired robot with mechanical joint coordination and toe-triggered clutching action energy efficient legged locomotion or his really exciting bird bot robot um, that just came out. So looking forward to the talk um, and I'll turn it over to you. Cool. Thanks so much, Amy. I'm trying to do the sharing. Um, I hope you see the first slide. Yeah, we do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to present our work and, and this is, this is of course, group work. And uh, in this case, it's the co-op work together with our boys. Monica and, and Metin City, um, but I'm also going to wrap this a bit up in in our um, in, in previous work, uh, which led to this project specifically. So I would like to kind of um, uh, explain a little bit the background, how we how we got to this project, and what kind of which problems went there. Um, so you basically get the CV. So I'm going to skip this one slide. I think that's okay. Um, and so in general, on the uh, the idea of, of my research group to, to focus on legs are the outstanding features which we have also on the engineering side once we implement legs. And of course, we're not there yet. And there are fantastic examples right now. It's being developed worldwide. But let's very shortly look at that. So we also have fantastic and flat surfaces, and we have been developing them all a long time. But they fail in complex and also in soft terrain, so rugged soft terrain. And it's also where, where you see why, why animals shine in, in there for. Um, so if you can engineer your environment, you do want to have wheels. Um, but um, your, your wheels will also fa fail at steps. So you could therefore say, well, we use some special um, uh, like version like tracks, for example, but they're still heavy. They're getting better, um, but they also uh, fail again in soft terrain. Wings are being um, currently much in focus. Uh, quadcopters, for example, like the one examples, Above of examples, um, they're cheap, they're, we have good processing power and so on to get around. So again, fantastic engineering solution and also already existing in nature, but uh, differently Im implemented mostly. Um, but of course, you have limited payloads. Um, so interaction with the environment is therefore limited. If you really want to move things around, if you, if you want to be on the ground, as in you, you want to change things, you want to have action with the, with the surrounding, then on a winged system, you're pretty much limited by the, by the weight of the wing system itself or by the, by the actuator power, but you, you don't have too much. So legs, therefore, well, seems to be the perfect solution. There are, we have examples in animal killing, all terrain. Um, and as humans, we obviously work in our own environment, walk in our own environment, so we have a perfect fit. Um, we can build up very high interaction forces with the environment. Let's, you, want to, you want to carry something around, you want to move something around. But the disadvantages, um, which uh, both the engineers, but also the biologists are facing, we don't fully understand um, how in animals, at least, everything works from the neural control side, uh, over the mechanics, over the, the, the biomechanics, over how muscles being activated, but even control concepts from like hierarchical control, control concepts or detailed low level control concepts. There, there's a lot, a lot of questions remaining. And on the engineering side, um, many of the legged systems which we have had so far, or also have so far, have a very high power consumption. They're comparably complex and expensive, therefore. 
so there's a there's a lot of things still to develop and things to understand. Uh, I think that's that's where we are with the dynamic locomotion group um, are really uh, looking into the details. Um, once you have this developed, uh, we could um, support there for, for um, like either specialized or general applications like space travel. And again, we're not the first one thinking of this one, of course. And uh, working hazardous environment, uh, it would have been great to have in, in these situations, which are shown in the pictures there. Um, I'm much more excited about um, the examples, the, 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 the follow-up examples, the robotic garden. I, I find this wonderful, the idea of having legged robots which go around in your garden, or if we could reduce the impact of what machines are currently making in, uh, when, we, when we have our harvesting or when we plant our seeds and crops. Or if you go into aqua, if you go into the forest, I think there is a lot of um, legged robotics still. Um, there, there's a lot of potential for legged robots. What is already being exploited or at, at least developed are these last bit of delivery systems or cargo deliveries, bringing you your your package from your preferred um, supply company to to your door, and that makes a lot of sense. And uh, warehouse and package handling is, is kind of an intermediate solution. So um, I'm basically introducing the topic a little bit also from the engineering. And, and the application side. Um, but strictly speaking, here at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, we are Max Planck Institute in Germany. Um, we are fairly free through the, uh, the, the educational system. Um, we are fairly free to do um, fundamental research. So uh, what we're doing is we're trying to understand how animals in, in my group work. We don't have to yet fully develop these products here, uh, which, is a, which is a large amount of freedom. Um, I'm very thankful for that. And so let's shortly look at um, the general concept, how we're approaching our problems. So um, we're reading basically a lot of papers and we're talking to biologists um, because biologists are trying to understand the animal from a top bottom perspective. You, these, as a biologist or a biomechanics person, uh, researcher, you observe and you try to understand all of the details and you see this enormous complexity. And the complexity is really um, a result of evolution and um, yeah, basically evolution, you, you wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap up uh, many, many functions and um, you, you observe the complexity and you try to understand this complex system and re reduce complexity to you therefore from this perspective, you will um, either classically or digitally dis dissect these systems and then you map them and recreate them um, and then you try to model them. And this is the fantastic starting point. Um, as the engineer, as the engineers, we will do a little bit the opposite, we do the, the bottom up, we say, okay, if a biologist could ideally already suggest a function, then can we implement this as in a robotic system? And therefore, can we take this um, su suggested function, can we test this in, a, in its individual case, so in, in its isolated case? Because um, the idea is if we have these isolated um, scenarios, let's say we have a specific controller, we have a specific mechanism, we can build them on top of each other. So we can increase complexity, therefore, and build these robots. And therefore, the idea would be I, that you can prove that, as for example, a certain morphology is related to a function, that a certain control is related to a function because that's the only thing which the system has. So if, you, if, you, if we are able to produce really simple systems, then there is at least a high amount of, uh, we're, fair, we're fairly um, sure that, 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 there's a, that there's not just a correlation, but there's actually a real function based on our morphology or our controller. Where in biology, you really have the problem. Uh, you see a certain leg structure, you see a certain muscle configuration. You say, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure because I observed this in this animal A and B and C. Therefore, I think there is a proof. But in fact, there is because of the complexity, there are typically so many, many different solutions possible. So um, as the engineers, we really try to um, help also in this cycle, hopefully, um, of um, bio-inspired um, research. Um, we try to help test some of these blueprints. And then in the perfect case, um, biologists would look at the blueprints and say, hmm, okay, is this really what we could observe in the animal? Let's have a look there again. Could we therefore improve our experiments in the animals? Or that includes, of course, uh, experiments with humans as well. And can we therefore enhance our models or can we therefore enhance our understanding? So um, I, I see this a bit of a loop or as a as a spiral of research, and uh, that's at least uh, what I would like to develop. Um, I'll start here with the Cheetah Cup project, <laughs> which Amy mentioned. Um, this one um, I started as a as a, doing my PhD at the end of my PhD uh, initially as a student supervision, and then as a postdoc I was working um, with Alki Eastbird. This was a big teamwork also, 
And this goes back to um, one of my previous professors, uh, Hartmut Witte in Ilmenau. And he suggested what you see on the left side, uh, which is a leg, it's a free segmentation of a leg based on a very small quadrupedal animal there um, on the top, which is kind of a hamster-like animal. Um, and what he observed is, and this is uh, observed together with uh, a research Vienna, uh, what, what he observed and, and, and documented is that if you take the free segmented leg and if you overlay the muscle tendon units, so this complex muscle tendon system, and then you will find a pantographic behavior and specifically a spring-loaded pantographic behavior in, in those legs. And he suggested this one on the schematic drawings uh, from 2003 and a couple of follow-up ones. And in Cheetah Cup, we basically mimic this, um, we, 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 we change this and um, the instrument, we, we um, put motors on the system, these are the servo motors we see on the top. And we, we really wanted to test if this pantographic leg design could be a building block to replicate locomotion, where you have parts of the functionality, which is uh, having compliant legs and sense phase embedded in hardware. So we don't want to control them. We don't want to control this to a, to a large amount. We say in animals, what if legs actually work as, as springs? And uh, let's try this out. The second ingredient to build Cheetah Cup back then, uh, uh, I was, uh, this is Alka Esprit's uh, lab, uh, the biorobotics lab. And so he's an expert in central pattern generators. And we implemented a wonderful central pattern generator, what you see. So on the right side, you see the equations. Um, the, these are equations are presenting in biology um, um, basically uh, coupled uh, neurons which produce oscillatory output. And these can be described either with very complex equations or with relatively simple equations like the one on the right side. And the input um, of these equations would be the bottom free, um, so like phase coupling, offset, and uh, amplitude. So a CPG is controlled by sending, sending a tonic signal. Um, to the CPG, which you're solving online. And the output is this highly, uh, this high dimensional oscillating output, what you see on the top. And you see um, in the first, uh, between uh, zero and 10 seconds about, you have this first gate um, where, you, where the, the gate is established and then you, you switch into the second gate by changing the phase coupling. So uh, the only thing which is changed between, uh, around uh, second 15 and 20, you change the phases between oscillators and you create a different gate pattern and so on. So um, in the third and the fourth zone, it's a very easy system to generate um, output on very few control parameters. And so it's really nice for if you want to apply learning with that, or if you want to just parameter tuning, um, you can create complex output patterns, which are like in intrinsically um, bio-inspired because they're, they're copies from central panel generators. These central pattern generators are proven to exist um, in many animals. Nowadays, so by, by now there's enough research to say really it's many animals in the spinal cord. So these kind of coupled neurons exist in the uh, spinal cord, for example, of lampreys, and they produce these oscillatory output patterns without any um, oscillating input. So it's a, it's a tonic input, produce oscillate, oscillating output, and it's very easy to control, few parameters, very easy tool to do. Um, we implemented this on, on cheetah cups. So uh, just to describe this a little bit, we got the pantographic leg. Here we mounted a small foot. Uh, we have the we have eight servo motors, so two servo motors per leg. Um, the first servo motor is where you see the uh, the hip point or the shoulder point, so that swings the leg forward, forward and backward. And the second servo motor, and that's a bit special, is here sitting on top of the robot and it's connected with this cable mechanism. The important part is because it's a cable mechanism, it can only induce flexing into the leg, um, but not extending. So you we flex basically here the knee joint. But this cable mechanism is never extending. Instead, the extension is always given by the springs. So that's a very important point for this project. Um, and so the uh, yeah, it's 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 only actively flexing and never extending. So as a function, what you see is uh, if the if the leg length motor is switched off, so there's no influence. Uh, we have the leg angle here blocked, just so it doesn't move forward and backward. But what you see here, basically, the robot stands on its own and does not need to extend the legs uh, passively. This is literally this pantographic, the spring-loaded pantographic behavior, what you see here. Um, and that means, um, when I, you saw me dropping the robot here, the, you, you need no control. So you have a, a system which uh, really works based on mechanics. So the, the function of spring-loaded uh, spring leg is, is embedded in hardware. And, oh. 
And uh, this is uh, the Cheetah Cup walking in 3D then also in, in the corridor of the biro, of the old biro. Um, and let me run this one more time. You see it's going a little bit backwards and forwards, so I'm using the tail to, to guide it uh, either left or right. But otherwise, this is um, a, a feed-forward controller. So there's no feedback happening in the entire system. Everything is running uh, feed-forward. And the system was also to some amount self-stable, so robust. The step-down again, um, this step-down step -down experiment, we, did, we repeated 20 times. Um, depending on the leg configuration, on the exact leg configuration, this is either successful or non-successful. But we could basically show um, that the, the step-down, which is an increase in potential energy, this, en this energy is being dissipated into the system. You see a little bit in the follow-up steps, the, the robot bounces a bit higher, um, but the system does react sufficiently benign on, on, uh, and it bounces in the right direction. So the uh, input energy, the input potential energy is being converted eventually out in forward energy, partially into upwards energy like here, but mostly it's being dissipated within the next step. So we have, uh, for this reason, you have a robustness. We also transferred the same leg design to Ancilla robot, which has a bit more fancy motors here, but is otherwise about the same leg design, has a degree of freedom more and kind of many, many more sensors. Um, and then once you have that, you can have this as a, uh, you, you, once you have this additional degree of freedom, you can also have the, these kind of robots then turning. So Ancilla robot here is underneath EPFL's library turning around, um, uh, remote controlled and battery powered. It's a cute little robot here with socks on. Um, the same leg design uh, was picked up here in this case by Felix Rupert, for example, in my group. We wanted to look uh, into detail uh, of the, uh, the two, so of the monoarticulate spring, which extends the knee, and the biarticular spring, which extends the, or which connects the, uh, like the, uh, the gastrocnemius or the soleus. So it's flexing the knee and it's extending the ankle joint. Um, with the hypothesis that the, uh, the, this B-articular spring, because of its placement and, and where it's mounted within the morphology, that it could act as a rotation of physical leg compliance. Um, this is the experiment then of the implementation. This is the pantograph without the second spring, so only one spring. Um, this is uh, hopping on the boom. It's the same, but now with both springs. So these are three segmented springs as three segmented legs, two, two springs. And shortly looking at the numbers, especially on the right side, we see that the uh, two spring leg version is effectively reducing the necessary hip torque in the system and also the input power. So because the, the second spring works as a rotational leg, leg spring, so in, in rotational direction, it's reducing the amount of input energy for the motor and uh, the input power of the system. So therefore the system became uh, more energy efficient. So we found this very interesting that we could, um, that Philip Fix could show uh, the implementation of multiple springs. It really basically it really matters where you place springs and how you place springs um, within legs. So I stopped here at explaining BirdBot's, um, yeah, so BirdBot's power consumption, efficiency, sorry, Cheetah Cup's power consumption and efficiency. So we had 400% up here. So that's electrical cost of transport specifically. So you see uh, it's in log scale on the left side on the, on the vertical axis. Um, but the important part is this red line, what you see is the comparison. So that's the natural run, that's the average uh, cost of transport value of an animal of that size. And the x-axis is the, the, the body weight basically. So Cheetah Cup, for example, is about a kilogram, so two pounds. Um, so the animal of that size would have 100%. So that's the average cost of transport. And um, Cheetah Cup, in comparison, had back then 400% cost of transport. So it was, was highly inefficient. Um, so let's shortly look into how comes that a robot which has springy legs um, is highly inefficient. The, the core answer is really um, in the, the, the spring-loaded um, legs, which are extending, are unfortunately, uh, they're fantastic, as you see here on this slide, in stance phase. So B is the example for cheetah cups. We have a spring which wraps around, for example, the knee. Um, so in stance phase, this whole thing acts as a, as a spring, and I don't have to insert any energy. In comparison, for example, the solo robot here on the left side, which is one of the standard robots, in sense phase, the motor has to carry the, the weight of the, the robot. So let's say this is a two kilogram robot, then the motor has to do the equivalent of two kilogram multiplied by the distance here of these, these horizontal distances. And that's the torque um, these motors would have to carry. So cheetah cup, fantastic. And stance phase, better uh, than, than, the, uh, than directly actuated robots, for example, but 
in swing phase on the right side, um, you need to now have to, you need to now work against the springs. So this high antagonism which you create um, that costs you certainly energy. And if you look, we need now to lift up the leg even more than in normal stance phase because we need to swing the leg through. And this is really cost of normal uh, spring loaded legs is the, the actual energetic cost is in uh, working against that spring. So the um, the definition of the problem here really is we want to get a spring out of the way. And that was that was so what, I, what we needed to figure out. So what you see was, is the solution. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you, um, you're not in presenter mode just to let you know. Yeah. You want to have it larger? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So on the right side, you have the, uh, the solution for that. Um, basically, what we kept, we still have the spring, which is still wrapping around one of the joints. But we now make, based on the observation, which I show in the next slides, uh, we now use the orientation of the foot or of the toe joints. And we can, uh, by moving forward and backward, uh, we can select this entire cable. So we can basically select the, the, the spring if we connect the other end of that red line system from B, if you had connected all the way down to the toe or to the foot, and if we therefore use the orientation of the foot by flipping it backwards, we can therefore select the, the spring. And that allows us now to select that spring in swing phase. And we don't have this cost of working against the spring in swing phase. And that's really the core concept of the improved energy consumption in bird bond. We, we first needed to create a system where we have a global spring, which wraps around all of the joints, and second, um, then in swing phase, um, allows us to uh, create enough slack on, in this entire system and then solve all of the, the connected problems for that. So that brings me a little bit. So basically, really the cost, in, so that, that also condenses to the cost of, of legged locomotion. Either you had the, the robot like solo, so then your cost, uh, the energy, energetic cost in, is in stance phase or mostly in stance phase whenever the, the robot has to carry the leg has to carry uh, the robot. So whenever the motors have to carry the robot, then you have to induce the energy. Cheetah cup is the opposite. You have to do that when you swing the leg and you do need to swing the leg for any robot which, which doesn't hop. If you have a hopping robot, you can actually get around that because you don't need to shorten your leg. But if you walk or if you run and if you uh, swing your leg forward, you need to make it shorter than this, the leg which is on the ground. And that seemingly very trivial function is actually what costs so, so much energy. And so with BirdBot, we tried to get around this one. And the inspiration came from my work with Monica and from uh, 20 years of experience of Monica with running birds. And she was the first one to explain me that um, birds have fantastic tendon mechanisms which wrap around basically all of the joints. Um, going from the toes to the um, to, uh, very high up over the, the kneecaps. And second, what you see here is, and which I'm stopping a little bit the video, um, you have this um, strong movement of the toe joints. So these are not the feet, these are strictly speaking the toe joints. Um, so you have, uh, you go from a strong extension to a strong flexion in swing phase or you, uh, into a strong extension in, during stance phase. Um, and that's the observation what, what we see here in this high speed video, but this is valid for all of the running birds you see out there. You have this uh, switching from extension to flexion much more than in humans, right? So humans, we as humans don't have this strong behavior. And the surprising part was then I was working, um, I was allowed to, to attend some of the um, cadaver dissections. And that's where I first observed that um, when I moved the ankle joint of the, of the cadaver bird, it would move the TMP joint. So this more distal joint um, on the right side, it would move as well. So that basically we, we come back to mechanical coupling, but this time not from knee to ankle as in the pantograph system, but here from ankle to TMP joint and also the joint four. Um, again, cut up a bird, it means there's no neural control active anymore. So everything is mechanically coupled in the bird and it's, it's coupled in that way that the movement, what we see here in the cadaver is the same movement, what we see in the alive bird during locomotion. So that's super interesting because it means if I see a movement, which is mechanically, um, embedded in the system, then I need kind of only one actuator to do this or very few, few actuators or the other way around. Um, if I combine this with the information we, we had before, I want to eventually have a toe joint which couples upwards into the ankle and into the knee, then that's actually the blueprint you want to have. And so on the bottom, you see the, the general network. It's a, it's a very complicated network of multi-articular uh, tendons and, and then muscles, which are reaching as extensors eventually also into the, uh, into the kneecaps. Um, a second part 
but you see a little bit the sketch still on the top left in the swing phase, what we need to fully relax that spring is we need a lot of slack on the muscle tendon system. And um, so distally on the toe joints, you see that I, I was drawing the, uh, the tendon not directly connected to the joints, but actually more away. And this is, um, if, you, if you don't have this, then um, I, I wouldn't be able to flex the leg as much um, because it really depends on the actual parameters. And, and so I, I, I ran into this problem when I was designing the leg, but um, we had not by this time yet looked at the, at the bird legs. And so Monica helped me to, uh, and she did a dissection here and we looked actually, and we found that the slack of the tendons really happens also in birds. So if we move again, the tendons, so if we move the, the distal uh, joints of the bird, then we see strong slacking of those tendons in this area. So this is also indicating, uh, this is another indicator that um, the, the slacking, the distal slacking helps then to relax the, the, the proximal and the mid leg um, muscle tendon mechanism. And um, yeah, so this is the movement here. Um, so uh, here you see the, the drawings uh, for, for the robot. So um, the robot implementation, as you see here, was, was uh, done by Albor Savastani. Uh, he's a PhD student in, in my group. He's about to finish. Um, and so he did a wonderful job um, mounting the LC servo motors. There's a lot of instrumentation on BirdBot. Uh, so you see a lot of force sensors. You see each of the joints has position. Um, so we, we record the positions. And also each of the motors is being recorded for power consumption. And all of that one is pulled. And all of this is implemented on a, on a robot, which is about three pounds heavy. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of cables, um, a lot of experiments to do. And on the left side, uh, on the right side, yeah, maybe um, to have the function of flexing, as I showed before, what is needed is that global tenon, um, this, the red tenon, which you also see on the left side, but for the extension of the toe joints, what is then needed is, the, uh, uh, is an additional set of extensors uh, so we have actually more, more, more tendons working in, in the entire system. So, and once you have that, so you see that none of the motors is activated. I'm only doing the movement here at the knee joint. And everything which you see distally is basically coupling from either the global uh, spring tendon or from two additional toe uh, tendons, which are uh, extending the toes in preparation for touchdown. In the left side, you see the entire mechanism, the extensor mechanism here only. Uh, working in stance phase. So uh, on the top, we, we mounted the, the, the spring uh, up there. So of course could measure the forces um, from there, but you could also mount it on the femur if you wanted to. But uh, really important, it runs over all of these joints and especially the cams of all of these joints are pre-calculated according to the equations which we also supply in the, in the manuscript then. So, um, and that's, that's in fact, that's a, that's, that's a really easy calculation. So. Um, the complicated morphology, what we observe in the animal, I really, I abstracted this one and simplified this a lot, uh, saying, okay, we only have hinge joints, we don't have the complicated um, surface interactions of, of birds. And also instead of saying we have this nonlinear movement of patella joints and sesame, sesame bones, sorry, patella bones and sesame bones, uh, we all only have um, simple cam mechanisms, which are which have a, with a fixed radius. And once you make these assumptions and you say, I want everything onto, onto pantograph like then the equations actually become so simple that you can solve it even geometrically on a piece of paper. So you, you can literally draw the lines and, and you can figure out the, the cam sizes based on that. Um, yeah, I've worked here, I built this wonderful setup on the right side. So you see a digitization setup on the top, which does all of the AD reading, um, the same as for the motor controls he sends with an interface on the bottom right, um, he's controlling the, the CPG, which runs in this case on, 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 a, on a MATLAB PC. Um, everything is run on a treadmill, so um, BirdBot, and, and it's held in plane with this parallel guide, what you see there. So you can go forward and, and backwards and, and up and down, but there's a pitch fix and it cannot fall sideways. Um, so BirdBot is a proof of concept to show that the lag mechanism works and how the lag mechanism works and you saw what numbers. So that's the video for a, uh, let me think this is a one hertz gate here. Um, I, I'm actually not sure, can you hear it? Oh, I it's, can't hear it. it. It's not important, it's, uh, yeah. Um, but I did uh, shortly to explain. Basically the important part is um, the sliding mechanism here allows uh, the, the robot to, to go forward and backward theoretically. So we just, uh, I was just set the, the speed correctly. 
uh, both of the robot and the treadmill. And as you can already see, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, there's this very strong vertical oscillation and you also see the springs moving around. Um, that's the, uh, that's an overlay, uh, the, that's the presentation of from the same videos. Uh, so the, the joints, the joint angles are tracked and then I was overlaid this with the mechanics and overlaid all of the tendon networks, which is I think a wonderful example to see. Um, so you see basically the red tendon, which is the global muscle tendon. Um, the blue one is the flexor, so that's active where the, the, the flexing motor pulls on the leg at the end of stance phase. So that should be, um, does this work? Yeah, okay, we don't see this here. Uh, you'll see it in a second. And the two green tendons we see in the front are um, extending the toes. And there's an additional disengagement tendon down here, which is a B-articular tendon at the end uh, of the leg, which has buckling and an extra joint, which we embedded there. To, uh, to, to disengage the loaded um, leg spring at the end of sense phase. Um, this is the high speed video. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of, um, when you, when you impact it here, the toes are touching down. Um, there's a lot of wobbling happening. Um, what you see, not in the other videos, but you will see here, have a look at the back here at the, the springs whenever the leg is being um, here, it snaps. So this is the global tendon, uh, spring tendon, which basically um, disengages at the end. And so the energy is, uh, uh, is jumping back, or so the energy is released of the spring tendon. Um, yeah. Uh, a couple of numbers from the gate. The comparison what we made here is the uh, knee flexing torque of cheetah cups, so the central ro robot versus third bot. And so the non-clutching model, which is the cheetah cup model, would require if we want to flex the leg, so if we want to pull the leg to a certain amount into swing phase, um, and we have the same amount between birdbot and cheetah cup, then um, on birdbot, um, our force measured 0.3 newton meters, and um, we calculated that would be equivalent of 3.7 newton meter for cheetah cup. So that's again coming back to the original story um, with cheetah cup, the uh, torque which you need to apply to um, work against that extensive spring is, is very, very high. And by disengaging that spring through the toe mechanism, so by, by, by this entire coupling mechanism, we can get rid of that. And the only thing which you really have to lift up is the, is the weight of the leg now. Um, so now let's look also at birdbot. Birdbot in the experiment, so we have birdbot um, with, the, uh, with the power consumption and without the power consumption, so net and, and um, with the power consumption of the electronics. So it's around 117 to 91%. So in general, we would say but what is, is in this configuration as we show for the gate of um, one and 1.5 Hertz, it's about 100% of the cost of transport uh, of, of, so it's equal about to the cost of transport of an animal of the same size. In the paper, we also compare this directly to a couple of birds. And it's the same message basically that with the clutching mechanism, now, very different from Cheetah Cup, we can uh, decrease the cost of transport massively. Um, maybe some, some of the other legs, which are also here shown. So there's the BR leg, that's the one from Felix, which I showed before, because that's a hopping leg and it doesn't have to flex the leg during, during, during the hopping cycle. That gets an aggressively low cost of transport. So this is 45%, for example. Similar spear, which is um, uh, also a hopping leg, but this also has some kind of a disengagement mechanism. This is also about 100%. Um, the interesting other data point is MIT data on the very right side. So that's about 30 kilogram robot from MIT, uh, from Sangabe Kim's group. Um, that's MIT cheetah free. Uh, I think we took the numbers from this one. That's one at 87%. Uh, one of the reasons why MIT cheetah is so very good in cost of transport is because of what we understand is because it has uh, a much better motor gearbox ratio. So um, ours is using a standard uh, Birdbot is using a standard um, high geared uh, servo motor. So these are brushed servo motors and these are, these are highly inefficient and they're very inefficient in fact for, for oscillatory motions like ours. Um, you have a 200 to one gearbox ratio. We know that um, if you go nowadays down, you can break this down to, to much, much lower. The second reason, so, so MIT here is using an optimized gearbox ratio. And second, um, they also has, have recuperation. So part of the negative power of the system is actually recuperated directly back into the system. So there, what I'm saying is that there are different ways of solving the problem of energy efficiency. 
Um, ours with the clutching mechanism is a mechanism is, is a way where we don't have to overly engineer. We can use really basic uh, motors. We don't need to have a clutching concept. We don't need to have this even for this basic function. What you see here, we don't even need to have a um, uh, a controller. So this is a this neither sensors nor controllers are needed for BirdBot. Um, a few words to scaling. Um, what you see here is, is, a, is a, just a large model of the leg, and um, you see Alborz and me hanging. So I'm hanging and Alborz lifting the leg. Uh, the important part is when I'm when I'm hanging in the leg. So actually, I'm I'm really I'm not on the ground. But I'm really hanging on the hip of the of the leg. Uh, it's about a yeah, it's about my size the leg, and uh, we didn't measure the weight. But uh, the important part is you see the main spring is being compressed, so it's being loaded as if I would be riding that leg, for example. And the right side, when Alborz is lifting the leg, I see that the main spring is um, is, is, is slack. So um, because the toes are pointing backwards, the mechanism is disengaged. So you can easily lift the lower part of the leg. Uh, in fact, he doesn't lift the upper part because that's not the point of the exercise. But um, something this leg can can easily hold two, three, four hundred kilograms. But you only need to have you only need to lift about twenty kilograms, whatever lightweight you can make the lower part of the leg. So the, this asymmetry now it comes from uh, designing legs, and this is uh, this slide here. This comes from designing legs, where um, other than before with solo or with cheetah cup, now you can still scale, scale things up largely because in sense phase you can still use the concept of the spring. But in swing phase, you you take the spring out of the way, um, and so you only have to lift up the legs, uh, the lower leg, uh, and that means from now on we can build robots to very very large sizes. But also we have a possible explanation for gigantism in biology. So that's what I'm also very excited about, and really hope that um, uh, in the next time we will communicate a bit with biologists and how much they think this is actually a really feasible explanation. Um, of course. There's an engineering point of this one. Maybe you could ask Elon Musk to, to build a, a legged robot which carries around his, his rockets. Um, I, I would find this very fun. Um, but I mean, the point is really so far, what was stopping building legged robots really, really large is you needed very strong motors which would supply enough torque in the joints to lift up the weight. And uh, that is scaling as in you needed larger and larger motors to carry around more weight of the robot. So for a larger robot, you need to have larger motors. This is not the case anymore because our leg length function is really taken over by a spring. And this one can, this can be built very uh, lightweight and a clutching mechanism, which is directly embedded into the leg structure. It's actually part of the leg structure. So it's a super, super lightweight system. It works without sensors, it works without control, at least in its basic function. And it's engaging uh, rely reliably uh, at the beginning of stance phase and the end of stance phase. So to wrap up these points, um, we have a fully size scalable um, system for uh, which is size scalable for load and activation. Um, BirdBot itself here, and so this is BirdBot number one, Alboz is working on follow up ones, um, is highly efficient, energy efficient. Um, so it runs about 20 watts at 0.75 meters per second. Uh, although we're using relatively uh, um, inefficient motors, the mechanical stiffness. If you if you think of this one of the of the leg is uh, also the, sorry the, the leg stiffness mechanically switched so there's no electro uh, switch or there's there's no actuated switch pan and there's also no sensing needed so the switching happens immediately that's another very important point if you switch gains in legged like robots a touchdown you typically need to know that when you want to switch and there's also a dead time of the motors both of these terms can be fussy, especially if you go into rough terrain, if you go into soft terrain, when should you switch from a, a low gain swing leg into a high gain sense leg? We don't have this problem as long as the foot, as long as the toe joints of the robot point forward, the leg spring is engaged and it will engage whenever there is physical contact. And so this is a really important point. And the other cool part about it is really, um, as soon as the toes are pointing backwards, all of the other joints are slack. That means we have natural swing, swing leg dynamics, which is also not easy to achieve, especially not easy in Cheetah Cup. There was no swing leg dynamics in terms of all of the, the leg joints were still stiff. Um, the efficiency is about four times better compared to Cheetah Cup. Um, if you compare it to, let's say, Atreus, I think it was about three times better. But I mean, things it's not so easy to talk in legged robotics about energy efficiency because every system is using different motors, different actuator systems. And so this is very hard to, so the, the easy comparison in our case was we take a robot, 
which has almost the same leg design without the improvement from the, the clutching, but the same motors. And that was Gita Cup, and we could show that's really four times better. Uh, we show walking gates and, and gates at the transition to running. And um, we can really say that very many of the uh, design blueprints which are presented today were directly inspired from the co collaboration with Monica and her knowledge on, uh, on, 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 on large birds and small birds and the, the, the function birds and the morphology of birds. So much of these, um, uh, what the, in many of the observations on morphology, uh, we could transfer into this like design. And this is really the core uh, of BirdBot. Um, and so we hope that this will help to, so we really hope that the leg, what we have to bird, but leg will actually inspire biologists to look back at birds and other legs. And so like, so we know that horses also have, have seemingly similar mechanism in, in other animals, uh, we suspect as well. And to, to take enough, to, to have another look at those ones. And so I would be very excited about it. So at this point, I want to uh, thank um, my team. So this this was uh, this were like two or three projects I showed. It's important in the in the middle. There's Alborz. I'm not sure my mouse is not showing. Uh, who is uh, uh, offered with equal contribution for this paper? Um, and then of course I also want to thank my funding sources. So in this case, the Max Planck Society, and we also have projects from the DFG in Germany. And uh, with this slide, I'd like to. Yeah, if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer this one. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Um, really great presentation. I, I really do want to see a dinosaur robot. That'd be super cool. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> so much. <laughs>